This clip is brought to you by SaveWithConrad.com. Let's uh, let's let's agree to uh, to come back to some of the overarching stuff, and let's let's dig into the news and notes leading to the show, and then we'll put a bow on it at the end. Meltzer reported at the time that Vince Russo, uh, and he was sounding fairly desperate in the process, according to Meltzer, lashed out at criticism of his booking and blamed WCW standards and practices for the fact that the ratings haven't improved since he arrived. He did all of this on an appearance on WCW live and you and I recently discovered together uh, or got the bad news together that, uh, Bob Ryder recently passed away. Ryder was a pioneer in a lot of ways for wrestling on the internet and WCW live was, was one of those innovations. He and Jeremy Borash did a phenomenal job there. He's got Russo on as a guest and he says, Russo claims that, uh, the ratings haven't fallen. And that everything to this point was to put things in place for a big angle at Starcade and the next night with the recreation of the NWO. Russo blamed standards and practices for not allowing him to have Roddy Piper call Ron to sing fat, no longer allowing Ed to mimic Jim Ross's Bell's palsy, and not even allowing Buzzkill to burn incense on the air. Meltzer would say none of which one way or the other would have meant even a blip when it comes to the ratings. Russo says that WCW has to decide if they want a squeaky clean show or ratings, but they can't have both. And he said he was promised certain leeway when he came in. And for the first six weeks, everything was fine. But once the heat came from sponsors, the rules changed. He said, people in WCW have been trying to stab him in the back. They claimed people in the company are saying that the problem is at standards and practices. It's just that the shows he's been writing hasn't been, ve- haven't been very good. And he claimed that those people were doing the same thing that Jim Ross, Jim Cornette and Bruce Pritchard did to him in the WWF. He lashed out at all the critics Meltzer in particular with name calling. And a lot of people would assume that he's working an angle here. Russo says he's going to gauge his success by internet feedback and crowd response. (laughs) And, uh, among the ideas that he talked about on the show were to bring Lenny lane and Lodi back under the name standards and practices with crew cuts and glasses and have them play nerdy characters. He also talked about bringing back Jim Helwig as a full timer. And he says he's even talking with Bruno Sammartino and maybe he could join Zabisco, Orndorff, Anderson. And, uh, the Piper team to feud with Russo as the traditionalists who hate what Russo's done to wrestling. He talked about wanting to bring back Randy Savage, but said there's a contract situation on the side of his hands. And he talks about how Jeff Jarrett will be a main eventer starting early in the year. And he also claims if he left or was let go by WCW, he would never go back to the WWF because he could never work with Vince McMahon for another day. A lot to unpack from his appearance here on WCW live. Let's try to break it down bit by bit. People saying, you know, Hey, uh, the writing hasn't been very good. And he thinks <laughs> those people are stabbing him in the back, much like Ross Cornette and Bruce did. How does that read to you as someone who self admits, uh, you weren't the biggest Russo fan. I mean, you have to know Vince Russo in order to appreciate the depths of his delusion. If you don't know Vince Russo, you can't possibly begin to understand how twisted and in his own way, narcissistic he is. Um, He's like the fucking Andrew Como of professional wrestling. I, I, you know, I don't know what to say, you know, was standards and practices, you know, an issue it was for me. I never even heard of standards and practices and Terry Tingle, um, until sometime in 1998. And I've talked about it before, you know, I I remember her coming. I think we talked about it in the last show we did. I talked about Terry Tingle coming into my office and telling me that one wrestler can't call another wrestler stupid because it may be offensive to some people with learning disabilities. I get that. That's life. You know, I don't like it necessarily. I think, 
you know, when, and what always became frustrating for me, and then I'll, I promise I'll stay on track. What became frustrating for me, and in, in a way still is, is the kind of double standard that exists, you know, in entertainment. You know, you can do things in a scripted environment. You can call someone stupid. You can call someone ugly. You can call someone fat. You can call someone whatever you want to call them as a part of a story and a script and building your character. But, the, but wrestling, for whatever reason, was always in this kind of funky gray area. Even though it was scripted, even it was all performance-based, it wasn't reality, it wasn't a sport. But for whatever reason, people, especially in Turner, at this point, now this is Time Warner AOL. This wasn't Turner Broadcasting, you know, pre-AOL, pre-Time Warner. This was Time Warner and even more so AOL set this new kind of bar or this new standard where professional wrestling had to be much more politically correct before politically correct was a thing than any other form of entertainment. You know, you could have flamboyantly gay people in a sitcom. That's okay. But if you had somebody that was flamboyantly gay and you pointed it out and made fun of it or, or use it as a, a basis for humor, even if it was self-deprecating humor, you know, from the character that was portraying a flamboyantly gay person, well, that way you could do that. You could do it on a sitcom. You could do it in drama, but you couldn't do it in wrestling. You know, things that were okay in other forms of entertainment were not okay in wrestling. And that was a very hard thing for me to try to adjust to. And I still think it's unfair in, in some respects. I watch scripted television now and I think, could you possibly get away with that story or a version of that story? In professional wrestling? And the answer is no. Because even today, professional wrestling, for whatever reason, I still don't understand. And I'm sure there is one. But for whatever reason, I haven't been, you know, privy to, or nobody's explained to me, there is a still a double standard today. And it, it was true. And I'm sure that was frustrating for, for Russo to a degree. But let's be honest, let's look back at some of the things that Russo did from the time he was hired in September, I think, or October, and, and, and the things that we're seeing even on this show. Russo got away with a lot more in, in terms of the overtly sexual kind of silliness. And, and in this case, we saw a lot of, you know, mixed match, you know, mixed sex matches and phys physicality on women and things like that, that I, you know, could not have gotten away with. You might've been able to get a bump in or two, or, but, but matches, that would have never happened. Uh, under my watch, not because I necessarily wouldn't have wanted to do, do it, but because it wouldn't have been allowed. By 1998, that wouldn't have been allowed. So Russo got away with a lot more during this time period than I was able to get away with in 98 or 99. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. And, and while some of Russo's claims during that interview that you read back to me I can kind of relate to um, with regard to, you know, what Turner at that point, AOL Time Warner, what they, Time Warner really, what they wanted out of a wrestling show. I can understand why Russo was very frustrated coming from the WWE where, you know, you only had one guy to answer to. And, you know, he was walking women around on fucking in, in a dog collar, you know, in your underwear and bra and panty matches were, you know, the, the match of the week. And coming to AOL, Time Warner, th that he couldn't get away with that. So I understand his frustration. But all anybody, look, if you're a Vince Russo supporter, if anybody is listening to this, and I know there are a few because I, you know, they reach out to me in social media sometimes. All you need to do is go back and look at this show. This show, this is when Russo still had quite a bit of latitude. This show was all Vince Russo. This is out of the mind of Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara. And if any of you who still support and buy into, you know, the Vince Russo story, if you can go back and watch the show and find any socially redeeming value, the same standard that is used to determine the undeterminable, undeterminable, which is what is porn? Well, porn is anything that doesn't have socially redeeming value, sexual material. If you can go back and look at this show and find anything that has any 
from a wrestling perspective, socially redeeming value, i.e. entertainment, then I want to hear about it. One thing, one thing, even by accident, usually the talent is good enough to be able to even figure out a way to make something entertaining and worthwhile in spite of a bad head of creative. In this case, despite the fact that there were some massively talented people on this show and some that weren't, that were Vince Russo protégés that were drinking his Kool-Aid and were only on the show because they kissed his ass. And, and Vince Russo was trying to, you know, build his power base within WCW by being the guy that was going to give all of the underdogs a shot. All those talented, young, fresh talent. How many times have we heard that bullshit? All this young, fresh talent that were being held down by the, you know, the veterans and the guys like Hogan and Savage and Sting and Luger and blah, 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 blah. And Vince Russo was going to be the pipe piper that we're going to lead all this young, fresh, exciting talent to the promised land. Well, the young, fresh, promising talent didn't have it. But by surrounding himself with that lack of talent and he's in look these people were nice people i'm sure they had goals and dreams and aspirations and i'm sure they worked hard to get at least attention enough to be able to put on a show i'm not taking anything away from the talent although it probably sounds like i am i'm not but they weren't ready for prime time and this entire show aside from the fact that some of the right some of the creative and the the real matchmaking process not just the storytelling but, you know, to see a guy like Dean Malenko, Dean Malenko trying to have a match with Hacksaw Jim Duggan, who was in this 40-pound janitor suit, it was just criminal. I wanted to call Dean Malenko and apologize to him this morning for not having the experience and the strength of character or the vision or whatever it is I didn't have or the combination thereof to kind of find a solution to the problems that I was having in 98, 99, instead of drawing a line and saying a picket fight with people that were way up the food chain for me, hoping that it would come out well. It was just horrifying. Who would think that? Who would think that was a good idea? Putting Dean Malenko in the, oh, let's try. I know, let's resurrect another faction because, well, the NWO works, so I can do it too. It sucked. It sucked. Dean Malenko, oh, no, by the way, what did we have in a cruiserweight match that opened the show? Evan Courageous and Medusa. I love Medusa. She's a longtime family friend. I've known Medusa and I've been friends with her since 1987. I, I respect her husband and like her husband. I respect Medusa and like Medusa, but that match was fucking horrible. Well, why would you have a cruiserweight opening cruiserweight match with Evan Courageous and Medusa? Oh, I know why. Because Dean Malenko was trying to have a match with Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Piss me off. It is worth mentioning, you know, in the heyday of the cruiserweight division, you know, normally if you're, oh man, it's Starcade, they're opening up with a cruiserweight match. I mean, do you, do you remember what the opening match for Starcade 1996 was? I do not. Well, it's Ultimo Dragon and Dean Malenko. That was, that was for the cruiserweight title. Starcade 97. It's Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko. Now it's Evan Courageous and Medusa. Fucking Russo. If he was closer, I'd drive to his house and kick him right in the fucking teeth. <laughs> well, honest I to God. And at this advanced stage in my life, I'd have to make sure he was sitting down before I tried to kick him in the teeth, but I'd get him there. This is just... <laughs> That's self-deprecating humor, boys and girls. And there ain't going to be no Jean-Claude Van Damme shit going on in my life, but man, oh, alive. wait a minute. You know, when, uh, let's go back to Russo's appearance here on WCW live. Um, I, I, I don't know what, how to respond to this report that he's blaming standards and practices for the low ratings by saying, well, we couldn't call Ron to sing fat 
and Ed Farrar couldn't mimic JR's Bell's palsy anymore. And we didn't even have Buzzkill burn incense. Do you think those would have been <laughs> major moments for Nitro to? I mean, if Roddy yeah. would have called Ron to sing fat, I mean, everybody would have changed the channel from raw to switched over to this. And if buzzkill lit that incense, dude, I mean, that, that was a t-shirt opportunity. That was a watershed moment for WCW that's lost forever now. Yeah. And, and it certainly had, th those were the important things that Russo wanted to do that he wasn't able to do, which is why he specified them and made a point of talking about them. And to your point, ludicrous. Just insane, delusional. That's the word, delusional. And again, unless you know Vince Russo, unless you've been forced to work with Vince Russo and have the misfortune of working with him, the depth of his delusion is something that will escape the average person. You cannot imagine it. But this is a perfect example. Forget about the fact that there's no story to anything that he's doing on this particular pay-per-view. Well, with the exception of Bret Hart and Bill Goldberg, I'll, 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 I'll give that. But the rest of this was a, just a disaster of, of a creative effort. That's what was killing WCW even more after I left. Why do you, here's the other thing, you know, Connor, you hear me say this sometimes offline, you know, when we're not doing it podcast you know I'm, I'm fascinated as to you know why what's the motivation what were what was the thought process what motivated somebody to take a certain action whatever it may be and after watching this show and you know waiting you know to connect with you and stan for this podcast i, I was outside of my driveway with my dog kind of looking out over the lake and i was thinking to myself why why did brad siegel call me back hmm. After firing me, well, it wasn't Brad that did it, but you know what I mean. Why did Turner bring me back, Tim Warner? Why did they bring me back? Now I know. I didn't know as much. I mean, I had an idea, but after watching this, I'm surprised it took him to the middle or end of January to pick up the phone and make the call. Because this was, this show is Vince Russo. For all of you supporters out there, you people, you 12 people that listen to whatever the fuck he does on his podcast or I don't think he can even podcast because I don't think anybody will actually carry his show. It's that bad. And he's that bad. But if he does have some sort of platform out there and you watch it, you think he's actually a talented dude and you believe, you know, any percentage of his delusional bullshit, just go watch this show. This is Vince Russo. This is peak Vince Russo peak performance. He, he does still have, and I know, I know part of you, Part of this is just you trying to be entertaining and I appreciate that, but he, he does have a, uh, a real following. I mean, he, he has, he has fans. He has a platform. Uh, he has like, idiots. He has people that don't know any better. He has people that love to drink the Vince Russo Kool-Aid and he is a charming guy. He yes, can sell he his ass off. And if you're the type of person who has no perspective, no real understanding of anything, no willingness to understand anything, no willingness to be critical, then you're going to be a fan of Vince Russo's, you know, because he can be an entertaining, charming dude. But he's a fraud from, from at the deepest core of who he is. He's a fraud. Everything about him is a fraud. It's just, yeah, whatever. You know, if you're, you're a supporter of Vince Russo, God bless you. You know, I would be careful about driving a car by yourself or engaging in anything that requires any level of thought or analysis, because clearly you're not capable of functioning in a real world. But if sitting around listening to Vince Russo's take on life or wrestling <laughs> is your cup of tea that just, you know, God bless you. You know, uh, it's clear now, uh, the direction of the show today, I, I guess we're going to, we're going to be, beating up, <laughs> we're going to be beating up on Vince a little bit. I, I want to state clearly for the record, I've always had great interactions with Vince and uh, to your point, he is a charming guy and he is a likable guy, but also to your point, I never worked with him. So I don't know, you know, what those challenges must be like and, and how that dynamic might change, but just as a casual, um, in passing friendship relationship, Hey, how are you buddy? An acquaintance, if you will, uh, he could not have been more pleasant to me. Um, yeah, a lot of con artists are like that. Okay. I say all that to say this, some, the thing that jumped out at me the most, 
in this whole report from WCW live. And yes, I was having a little fun with no one gave a shit about any of those things that were cut. He was just complaining and wanted something to complain about. And I get that. And by the way, uh, we've all done that. I've done that. You've done that on this show. Sometimes you feel like you get painted into a corner and you're, Hey, this isn't all my fault. And, and certainly he didn't come into a good situation. Uh, he came into a bad situation, was asked to pull the nose up. And by that point, a lot of people would say it was too far gone. And I'm sure that's what Russo defenders are going to say. That's maybe a talk for another day. But when I read this, I thought he just, he doesn't get it. He said he promised, he was promised certain leeway when he came in for the first six weeks, everything was fine. But once the heat came from sponsors, the rules changed and the idea That he felt like now, bro, you promised me, you gave me your word. This is a business and the business here is selling tickets or selling pay-per-views, but that's all secondary because that's old school wrestling. That's all secondary to, we got to have a television product. This is a television company. How does a television company make money? Some people would say ratings, but if your ratings go up or down, what does that matter without sponsors? We've got to be able to sell it to somebody. So the reason you want more people watching is so you have more revenue coming in from sponsorship. I can't sell the show if the sponsors are pissed off. So even if you have great ratings, if you've alienated all of the sponsors, which at times WWE did where they had, you know, enough sponsor or enough eyeballs to in theory, have a beer sponsor or a car sponsor. They never came around because they were turned off. WCW wants to avoid that. They understand first and foremost, television is not a line item for us. We are a television company. The idea that he didn't know he couldn't piss off the sponsors is like, what? It's a TV company. Because he doesn't know anything about the television business. Look, I mean, there's, he never has, he's never understood. You know, this was Vince Russo looked at WCW and the opportunity that he conned himself into. He looked at WCW as his own little personal playpen. It was his, he he could live out his fantasy of, of, of what he thought wrestling should be. That's what he thought he was going to be able to do. And look, the product is what the product or the product was what the product was. And you can argue all day long that WCW was already on a downhill trajectory. And I would agree with that, by the way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't defend it or try to, to argue that that point i would agree with that point it was for a lot of two a lot of reasons but when vince russo came in and convinced brad siegel and bill bill bush that he was he was the guy who was really behind you know turning wwe around it was vince russo it wasn't you know vince mcmahon it wasn't anybody else it was vince russo um he convinced people that needed that wanted to be convinced that were desperate to be convinced that's what good con artists do they take advantage of people who are at a disadvantage and brad siegel and turner broadcasting was a disadvantage what do we try to do oh i know we'll hire the guy who says he was responsible for turning wwe around that seems like an easy solution but vince russo had no skill he had no talent now maybe maybe and i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm going to cut we saw a little slack here. Maybe when he was part of a broader, bigger team who could compensate for some of the idiocy and lack of real creative um, skill and instincts, maybe he was a functional part of a bigger team and worked well in that environment by being that voice that would kind of bring up some of the absurd. And you may have to shit can, you know, 49 of those absurd ideas in order to find some redeeming quality. And I'll give you an example on this particular show. There was one moment in this show, forget about the main event. We'll talk about that more later, but there was one moment, one moment outside of the main event that I went, Hmm, that's pretty good. And that was the moment when, and it was good for me, subjective matter of opinion. For me, I found it to be really kind of smart creatively, regardless of whether it was Vince Russo's idea or somebody else's where Sting and Liz were backstage and, you know, Liz was, you know, 
so, you know, I'll say soliciting, but, you know, convincing Sting that, you know, she was trying to get away from Lex and blah, 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 blah. And she had a can of mace to protect herself. And Sting said, no, take this one. This is the good stuff. And it was a, it was a can of string. So when, cause he knew Sting knew with, within the context of the story that Liz was likely going to turn on him. He didn't really trust her. And when that moment came, she picked up her mace thinking it was the high test stuff yep. and sprayed Sting in the face. And it was silly string. I thought, well, you know what? That was pretty creative because it was a seed that was planted and it was almost subtle. It was a very nuanced thing, but it was obvious too. It was a, a really good balance of, of, of a subtle story seed, but yet making sure the audience saw it. And then it played out at a critical moment in the match. That was good storytelling. And if that was Vince Russo's idea, then that was one example of a pretty good idea, if not a great idea, surrounded by 99 horrible ones. Um, but I don't know. Next question. I'm sorry. I went off into the weeds. I forgot where I was. No, I like when you do that. Let's, uh, let's keep it moving here. Um, Hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. So you get a notice anytime we upload some new content and go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much find out right now for free at savewithconrad.com.